This is the hardest part. <clears throat> I'm sitting in a Chinese restaurant eating a piece of pineapple pie for dessert. Maybe that sounds a little strange for a, for a Chinese restaurant, but it's on the main street of Tela, a banana port on the north coast of Honduras, where I work as a Peace Corps volunteer. I wonder how did this one Chinese family end up in Central America in this town? Or what about the Turcos, the, the Arabs who own the, the, the linen and the hardware stores? I do know about how the uh, Garifanos got here, the African Hondurans. They were escaped slaves who landed on the coast, and they still live in their beachfront villages and speak their own language with African roots. And here am I, the Spanish-speaking gringo. <clears throat> After I got to, uh, excuse me, <laughs> just before graduation from college, on a whim, I applied to the Peace Corps. I forgot about it until a few months later when I received an invitation to go to Honduras as a health education worker. I already spoke Spanish, so why not? <clears throat> After I got there, I found out they actually needed women to work with mothers, not men. I thought John was a pretty gender-specific name but that was their mistake. <laughs> so when I visited sites with other volunteers, I found another job at a community development agency, organizing rural school teachers to improve their schools and also teaching leadership courses to campesino leaders of the farming cooperatives. The cooperatives were formed when land was expropriated from the gringo companies after decades of exploiting the workers. And here am I, the gringo, to help them retake their land. <laughs> I have acceptance at all levels of society. The poor campesinos view me as a tall, bearded hero from the USA, and the wealthy families accept me as one of their own. But there are a few people who suspect that I work for the CIA. <laughs> you work for the CIA, don't you? No, I work for the Peace Corps. Right. There are three branches of government in the United States, the CIA, the FBI, and the Peace Corps. <laughs> and all three are the same thing. <clears throat> I only eat at local restaurants once in a while when I get tired of cooking. Everything here has to be cooked from scratch. Rice and fresh shrimp are the easiest things to fix. But I do remember one time when I stuck a spoon in the covered pot of rice that I had left on the stove. The rice felt funny in my mouth, and I spit it out, and there was a huge cucaracha. <laughs> I was by myself, but I yelled out in disgust that a cucaracha was in my mouth, and I washed out my mouth over and over. <laughs> Cucarachas are everywhere. When I go over to my office at the community center at night and turn on the lights, they scurry to all corners of the room as I break up their party. A tropical rainstorm is violently pounding on the tin roof of this Chinese restaurant. Not a good time to leave, so I eat my pies slowly. I've lived here a couple of years, so I'm used to these tropical storms suddenly appearing and then disappearing just as fast. But after several more minutes, I realize it's going to be a long wait. My little house is across the central plaza, about three blocks away. So I start running, knowing I will get drenched in this downpour and indeed, I do. Back at the house, where I live by myself, I never know what to expect when I open the door. <clears throat> One time, I was surprised by an iguana in the house plastered on the wall. But this time, as the rain continues to drench me, I fumble with the key and open the door. Suddenly, I see a flash of light in the back of the house, in the kitchen, and someone is moving there. What a perfect time to break in. With the rain beating down on the tin roof, the neighbors would hear nothing. And what fool would come home in the middle of a rainstorm? <laughs> Anger wells up inside me, and I yell out, ladron, thief. And I use the only weapon I have, the small carton of milk I was carrying <laughs> that I had bought at the store before I went to the restaurant. Got milk? The only thing I can think to do is throw it at the guy as he rushes out the back door. It hits the door with a thud. He leaps over the back fence to the house behind me, which is directly on the beach. I turn around and run out the front door and yell, ladron, to the neighbors sitting across the street. 
They then yell to the soldiers who are at the barracks down the street. The rain has finally let up a little bit, and I run around the block to the beach. There are flashes of lightning, and I can see the thief running on the shoreline in living color. He is running with my backpack, with my things inside, no doubt. Ihle puta. I am frustrated and angry. This is the third time my house has been robbed. I am sure he has my second cassette boombox, for which I paid dearly to have shipped from the US. Finally, I am going to catch a thief as my feet dig into the sand. As I'm chasing the thief, the soldiers show up on the beach. Oh, crap. They're shooting bullets, and I have no idea where the bullets are going as I chase them. But I am determined to catch the thief myself, and I run faster. Sweat drips from my face in the warm nighttime humidity. I am confident that I can catch him. I run a good distance on this beach every day. Even on a day when I have climbed up and, up and down a mountain, I still hurry home for my barefoot run on the beach. I'm excited that I'm finally going to catch him by grabbing a shirt. But to my dismay, this so-called shirt is just a tattered rag in my hand as he squirms away. I'm still resolved to catch him. And I don't even know where the soldiers are at this point. I keep running and finally catch up with him again. I pounce on him this time, and we fall into the sand. And then I look at him close up and realize that he's just a kid, maybe 13 years old. My anger turns to pity. The soldiers finally catch up with us and begin beating him, each one taking turns slugging him sadistically. I beg them to stop. He's just a kid. They finally take him away with the loot. But one of the soldiers comes up to me and says, hey, you need to pay me for the bullets that I shot. <laughs> what? You want me to pay you for shooting wildly while I was chasing the guy? You've got to be kidding. I just ignore him and head back to the barracks with the soldiers to get back my stuff. Sure enough, my little boombox is there, and the soldiers are counting the coins from my jar that was in my backpack. They come up with a different total each time they count the coins, which makes me chuckle to myself. You don't need much of an education to be in the Army. Drafting soldiers is very easy in Thela. When there is an action movie playing at the local theater, there are bound to be a lot of young men watching the movie. The Army just shows up at the exit and pulls all the young men into the truck as they walk out of the theater. They then take them back to the military base. That night and the next day, anybody who is anybody has a family member come pick them up. But if there is no reputable person to speak for you, well, you're drafted. There are a few other things in the backpack from my house, but the soldiers will not give my possessions back to me. We need to save these items as evidence. They then send the boy away to jail. As I leave to go home, I wonder when I will ever listen to my music again. A few days later, I see an article in El Tiempo newspaper. There is a photo of that boy standing between two stern-looking Dean agents. Dean is the Honduran equivalent of the FBI. It turns out he had previously robbed the Taylor mayor's house. And the, phone, the photo caption says the Dean agents themselves had caught this notorious criminal. Imagine that. Two grown men heroically capture a boy. At the local jail, the prisoners rely on family to bring food because it's not provided by the jailers. I guess it keeps the jail, uh, the jail budget low, but it seems pretty inhumane to me. What if he had no family to bring him food? Or what if it was a family that had no food to bring to him? My thoughts were that the kid stole out of necessity and I felt sickened by how he was treated. And other young, young Hondurans had previously asked me, why would anyone in the United States steal? You know, the USA, the land of plenty. Those kids could not imagine stealing other than for reasons of hunger. During the day, I would often hike up the mountain, up a mountain trail alone to villages, being careful to watch out for the dos pasos the two-step snake. Two, stakes, two steps after it bites you, and you're dead, they say. 
Some of these villages I visited were fortunate enough to build a, a, a cement block school. But when I got to some of the more remote villages, they didn't even have a grass hut school. Some of the people living in those villages subsisted mainly on tortillas and salt. Malnutrition was rampant. It was hard to make sense of this upside down world of privilege and poverty. When I'd climb down the mountain from visiting a village, still watching out for the Dos Passos snake, I would later hang out in the evening at Cesar's beachfront bar, listening to the jukebox, drinking beer, and eating good food. Una cerveza y dos tacos de pollo, por favor. One beer and two tacos, please. Or was it one taco and two beers? It's a crazy, mixed up, unfair world, and I still wonder whatever happened to that kid. Thank you. John Lee Evans, everyone. John Lee Evans.